All right, welcome back to the podcast. Lewis from Peels on Wheels. What's up, my friend? How the heck are you? Doing great. How are you, man? Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I'm excited to chat with you today. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we hooked up through Instagram, and you seem like you're doing some pretty cool stuff. So tell me a little bit, like give us the Twitter version about how you got started on uh, in the pizza world. So, so out of my 15 year career, I want to say at least 11 or 12 of that, those years was in the pizza industry. Um, and I've always been making pizzas at, at home for friends and family, you know, when I, when I wasn't at work and, uh, it was about last year, early April or mid April. Um, I purchased a portable pizza oven and, uh, it was really just to step my pizza making game up at home. And from there, it just turned into a small mobile pizza business because I started making pizzas for friends and family. And then the more people I made pizza for, the more encouragement I got from others to, to do something with it, you know, and start a business. And yeah. long behold, you know, six weeks later, Peels on Wheels was born. Wow. You went from th thinking about starting a mobile business to starting one in six weeks? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was literally that. I mean, I was making it for friends and family. And then, like I said, I just got more and more encouragement. And then, uh, you know, I, I started to realize that there was this like pop up pizza community. And um, I'm like, you know what, I could do something like this here in my city. Where are you? My wife was like, you know, you're in a position now, you know, at the time, my job, I was, you know, Monday through Friday, I had nights and weekends off and summers pretty much off. And, uh, she encouraged me. She's like, you know, you could definitely do something with, with this, you know, on the side. And um, from there, you know, we just had to really brainstorm and figure out what the hell we were going to do with these little portable ovens. Where, where are you located? So I'm in Rochester, New York. Okay. Uh, is, How far away from New York City is that for people listening? It's actually like a five and a half hour drive. Um, okay. We're not, we're not too close. I'm actually closer to Toronto, Canada than I am to New York City. Oh, wow. So you're way up upstate. Yeah, yeah. So I actually grew up in the Bronx. And, um, you know, from there, my parents moved out to Western New York. And we're about, you know, about an hour 15 outside of Buffalo, and then like an hour and a half from the border of Canada and the US. What's the pizza scene like where you are? Uh, actually, there's like a pizza renaissance going on right now. So I'm, I'm super excited to be a part of it. Um, you know, we've, I mean, Rochester, New York's just oversaturated with you know, franchises like uh, Salvatore's Pizzeria, um, you know, Mark's Pizzeria, some other ones are called uh, Pontillo's, and that's pretty much all you had. And you had some local mom and pop shops. Um, but now there's there's really starting to, to become some sort of renaissance where you have, you know, I don't know if it's because of the pandemic or what, but a lot more people are doing these pizza pop ups and, and starting these, these, you know, uh, pizzerias, but paying more attention to to that detail and, and quality and, and understanding, you know, the fermentation process and things like that. Yeah. Well, you don't know what the number one thing that was Googled um, during this whole pandemic was, don't you? No, no. What was that? It was how to make sourdough bread at home. Oh yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so I actually, I didn't start dealing with sourdough up until this pandemic, you know, I've been using stuff, you know, commercial yeast, yeah. yeast cake yeast, things like that. And then, uh, when the pandemic hit, you started to see a lot more, you know, pizza people actually making sourdough loaves and things like that. So I, I dove into it. And then from there, I actually use a sourdough culture in my, my dough recipe. I'm not a hundred percent naturally leavened, yep. but I use it more of like a Polish starter type of thing. Um, in a lot of my recipes. Yeah. I've been talking to a lot of people who've been doing that and I've even been trying to experiment with it a little bit at my house myself. Um, but it's not easy to do like naturally leaven dough is challenging and it, it's a lot more challenging than if you use yeast or if you have, especially if you're a mobile unit where you don't have like the kitchen or the walk-in or the environment to really manage it well. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that's why I'm using that, that, uh, you know, the active dry yeast and, and, you know, with the sourdough culture, just so I can have a little bit more control over, you know, the rise and all that. So um, I, I do have aspirations to do hundred percent natural 11, but I'm not at that point just yet. You know, being that I am a mobile business and I only have a commissary kitchen and I don't really have a, you know, your standard work size, you know, box truck for a food truck. Right. And, and I guess, you know, I'm just using the tools that I have and, and, you know, the knowledge that I have to do what I can. 
So we, so you're like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna open a mobile unit. You know, I've, I've been cooking at home. My pizzas come out great. My family and friends compliment me on my pizza. I'm gonna start a mobile unit. Like, what's the first step? So if someone's listening to this and they wanted to get started, like, what's the first thing that you did? Maybe right or wrong. So, so first thing I did is figure out what's my branding going to be and what's my name going to be. And my wife and I, we, we literally killed like two bottles of wine once we <laughs> for, you know, this mobile business and the names that we came up with were just atrocious. And uh, yeah, I think of like pies, pies on wheels, the pies guys, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of some other bad ones. I think but, I know all those people. Yeah. Yeah. And um, from there, you know, I wanted something kind of clever, kind of catchy, because you think of a lot of food trucks, you know, they try to do something like, you know, wraps on wheels or, uh, you know, rolling deep. So to kind of <laughs> you know, play on, 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 you know, a, a mobile business being on wheels or restaurant on wheels. Right. And uh, for me, my wife came up with the name actually Peels on Wheels. And I'm like, holy shit, that's it. That's the one we're going to do. Sorry, I swore. I'm that's not fine. Sure. <laughs> it's, okay. it's not a kid's show anyway. All righty. All righty. Um, so I'm like, holy cow, that's the one we're going to go with. And uh, surely enough from there, it's just like, how are we going to build, you know, the branding? And uh, my sister-in-law actually is an art graduate and she came up with my logo and she actually combined a wheel, a pizza on, on top of a peel. You might be able to see that there. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was it's something kind of clever, unique. And then from there, um, figuring out what, you know, the concept was going to be, um, and initially we thought it was going to be a workhorse box truck. And then we decided to go a different route, um, in importing a vehicle from Italy. But from there, um, we really had to figure out what type of business were we going to be a DBA, where we're going to be an LLC, you know, where we're going to be a, a corporation. Um, and then from there, once you, you sat, filled out all your paperwork and I decided to go with an LLC and, um, from there, it's just like, you know, figuring out your kitchen situation and what areas are going to service and things like that. So what did you do for the kitchen situation? We're like, where do you work out of, or is it just a, so, inside your truck? So I actually can't operate out of my truck. So my County allows you to, to like, if you have a workhorse box truck, you know, if you're going to operate as a food truck, you have to have a whole list of equipment on that truck, three base sink, cold storage, you know, freezer, uh, hand wash sinks, all that Ansel fire system, but the vehicle, pretty much anything they'd have in a regular kitchen. Yeah. So basically to operate as a mobile kitchen, you have to have all that equipment. Now my vehicle is no bigger than a golf cart. There's no way I'm going to fit all that stuff <laughs> on there. Um, so I had to figure out a way to, to be able to do this concept and still operate kind of as a food truck concept. And um, for me, I had to sit down and figure out where I could get a commissary kitchen. So I had to find a commissary kitchen. Once I got it, that into place, um, I went to my county health department and set that up as my commissary. And then from there, um, registering the vehicle with the county as a food truck um, and, and going that route. And I actually opted out of the food truck route. I decided to go with a mobile caterer for my county. It gives me a little bit more flexibility with what I can and can't do. Um, and then some other counties, I'm actually... Uh, registered as a food truck just because it works out a little bit easier. So every county is a little bit different. Oh, that's interesting. Regulations. Um, I wish I could just be, you know, the same thing across every county. But like I said, there's different rules and hurdles to, to jump through. So um, you have to register every city that you or a county that you kind of ha would have or you do work in. You have to register in each county that you would do events in? Yeah, yeah. So if you operate as a food truck, um, for the most part, you pay one fee for the entire year. Um, but then if you are a food truck, there might be like city, like limits where they don't allow food trucks in this area. Right. Or, you know, you have to be 50 feet away from a building or this main road or anything like that. Um, and for me in Rochester, it just made it a little bit more sense to be a mobile caterer or a caterer versus a food truck. That way I could do a little bit more events. Um, and like I said, it's just different. It varies from, from location to location. So like in Rochester where I am, I have to apply for a temporary vending permit, um, for every event. And typically those, those permits, I mean, they cost anywhere from 55 all the way up to like 150 bucks, wow. uh, depending the length of the, the time. So if you're doing a festival, that's 14 days long, you might have to pay, 
you know, $150 just to be able to vend food there. That's crazy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit more money out of my pocket, but then again, it allows me to do a little bit more events um, in the area. So what do you do for marketing? Like I know like a brick and mortar, you can set up a Facebook page, which I'm sure you do Instagram, which I've seen you have, but yeah. you can like do marketing to attract customers to come to you, right? Yes. Like you're catering to a different clientele where you need to have customers where it may only be a customer that comes to you once a year, right? Yeah. So, so for me, it's really utilizing the social media platforms and my website. Um, you know, I use the platform GoDaddy, which is a great platform. And I use that website and they partner with a company called Chow Now. And that's where I do all my online ordering through. And yeah. Chow Now is a good, Chow Now is a good online ordering platform. Oh, it's, it's amazing. It really is. But again, it's not meant for mobile businesses. So there's like a lot of hurdles to get through um, when utilizing that platform, unfortunately. So like for me, I have to do a lot of work on the back end. Yeah. I mean, very user friendly for the customers. Customers love it. Easy to navigate, you know, easy to adjust, you know, menu items, things like that. Um, but on the back end, it's like putting in the random hours that I'm going to be because I don't have set hours for the week. That's true. So physically go in there, create a menu for each different venue, create different hours for each different venue. And then I have to monitor like the, the different like times where, you know, last thing I want is to take a hundred customers between five thirty and six. So like I have to get on the phone and say, Hey, you need to shut down five thirty to six before I'm at capacity or anything like that. So it's, it's a lot of work on that back end, but I've been yeah. working with them a lot on trying to figure out how to make this a little bit more friendly for mobile businesses. So they're great. I mean, overall user-friendly, great customer service. They're always there for you 24 seven. So it's a great program. That's um, probably something that they should think about is because I'm sure there's a lot of mobile guys like yourself who want to use a simple online ordering platform. And like you said, Chow Now is great for the customer. It's very customer yeah. friendly, but if you're a, a mobile guy like yourself and all those scenarios you just mentioned, I'm sure like, they're like, Oh man, we never even thought of any of those. Yeah. So at first it, the, it was really difficult and I, I don't want to bash town now, but at first uh, being that I was a mobile business, it was very difficult for me to receive my disbursement. So like I'd go, you know, a few days in a row with events. And for some reason, the way I was uh, uh, adjusting like my hours was affecting the funds for all these, these, these customers that are paying to be dispersed to me. So sometimes it was, I'd go like two weeks without getting, Oh money. man. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. But you know, we, uh, after many, many different conversations, we were able to figure it out. Now it's smooth sailing, but there's definitely a lot of, uh, uh, uh trial and error. There was a lot of trial and error through the entire process, but now we're good. Now I'm getting paid, you know, as it goes. So good. Which is good. So, I mean, that's the name of the game. You got to get paid. Like, especially as a small yeah. business, like you, two yeah. weeks is a long time without making any money. Oh, you man. Put out yeah. all that money. It was definitely, yeah. it was, we felt it, you know, and there was a lot of stress and pressure, but no, I think, I think the program's great. And I think the most important thing is that it's very user friendly and customers enjoy the platform. And honestly, like that's the biggest thing for me is, is, you know, making sure that the customers are satisfied with our service and, you know, they don't have to, to have a headache and whenever they're placing an order, you know what I mean? Yeah. They want to make it like for us as owners, we can kind of deal with the headache a little bit. If it's going to be challenging for one uh, portion of the customer transaction, I would rather it be more challenging for me than the customer. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And that's exactly what my mindset, like, yes, I'm, I'm doing so much work on the back end, you know, for these events, you know, for this online platform, but customers are ordering and they're happy with it. So um, I, I guess that at the end of the day, that's all that really matters is a customer that's happy. Um, but yeah, so utilizing my website and that platform and then social media, Facebook and Instagram, um, you know, I had no, no sort of uh, experience with social media up until like probably around March or early last year of 2019 is when I really got into Instagram and I did, and it was just like, you know, to keep in touch with friends and family really. Yeah. Um, and um, from there, when I started this mobile business and getting to understand uh, Instagram was like, it was a whole different monster. You know, it's, it's, it really is like running on whole separate business in a way. <laughs> it's true. It, it, it really is. It, and it, it sounds so cliche to say, but like when, when, when you start to get a lot more engagement, more people are getting excited and, and trying to develop content and promote your events. It's a lot of work. I mean, just, just the, the daily motions of it. And I'm getting better about, you know, making time for it throughout the day versus trying to be on it, you know, 
yeah. all day, you know, setting a time frame from this time to this time, this time to this time, this time to this time throughout the day. So I'm not strictly, you know, social media, you know, driven, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. You got to like batch your time, just like you do with yeah. anything else, right? Like you're at the event from certain times. And before that you prep from certain times, you promoted from certain times. I think the thing about social media that makes it challenging for people is that our phone is always with us, right? Like we don't have a dough mixer in our back pocket all the time where you're like, all right, I'm going to make some dough right now. The phone's always with us. So that's what makes you, if there's a slow period of time, you're like, oh, maybe I'll just check my phone. But if you, the, you, you have to get good at batching your time and making sure that you set aside a certain amount of time to engage, to post, to, you know, research mm -hmm. and don't let it take over your life. No, no. Yeah. And, and in the beginning of this, I mean, in my first like six months, I mean, I was always on it, you know, answering every message, answering every, every, you know, uh, comment, um, as they were coming in. And then now it's more of, you know, now I have my set times throughout the day. Yeah. I dedicated to responding to those people. Um, or if I can't get back to them, I'll say, Hey, you know, follow up with me early next week on this day. Um, and I think that's very important, but utilizing those platforms to reach those customers and, and generate excitement, you know, for these events. So like I have this event upcoming on the 31st of Halloween and I'm trying to create as much buzz as I can for it because we do our Detroit style pop-ups once a month, just cause it's, it's very difficult with the type of oven that I have. Um, it's really not meant for Detroit style pizza. It's more geared for, you know, high temp Neapolitan style pizza. Yeah. And, um, so we do our Detroit styles. They sell out every single time we do them. We do anywhere from 80 to hundred and a pop up in a three hour window. But this one, we're, we're trying to go out with a bang to the end of the season and we're trying to sell as many Detroits as we can. Um, our goal is somewhere around 150 to 200 Detroits in a seven hour window. Wow. Um, so we are trying to, to create as much excitement as possible. So like every day I'm, I'm doing a little plug here and there about, you know, don't forget the link goes live on this day for our event on the 31st, that sort of thing. And then obviously sharing that information over both pages as far as Facebook and Instagram. And then on a, obviously on my website, I have links all over, you know, that will navigate them to a social media platform if need be. Do you, what kind of oven do you use for those? So I use a Gosney Rockbox. And okay. I have four of them mounted on, side, on the side of my little truck. Which and those ovens are mobile, like countertop ovens, right? I mean, I, you can't, you're not supposed to use them inside unless you have like a, a type two hood. Um, just cause they're powered by wood or propane. And obviously okay. when you burn either of those, I believe it omits carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Um, and obviously you don't want to poison your household. Um, <laughs> no, you don't. So, um, they're, they're, but countertop, they're, I meant like on a tabletop, sorry. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. On a, on a tabletop. Um, and, and, um, so for those, do you, so for your Detroit style pieces, I know how those work with Neapolitan style. They cook really fast. Once they get yeah. the temp, they cook yeah. them like in like 60 seconds, right? Like 90 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So 90 seconds or less. I mean, those things are built like a tank. They really can crank a, a significant amount of Neapolitan pies out in an hour. Do you, so for your Detroit style pizzas, do you pre-cook the crust or do you cook it to so, order? So I'd love to do it, you know, cook to order, but the yeah. way that I found that works best for this is to to par cook the dough. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, that's, that's where we top them at the event and bake them in the oven there. Yeah. Because they'll probably burn right before the dough would cook. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was the biggest thing. And, and Gosney provides, pro provides the, the Gosney community with a lot of different recipes that are user friendly to be able to do at home. But like, for me, I'm trying to get a good amount of volume out. So I had to really kind of dial it in out of the, the, the rock box. So like i had been making, Detroit style pizza probably for almost eight full months before I actually hit the ground running with it. Um, and, and I'm actually pretty proud of, of what we were able to do with the rock box oven, because like I said, it's not really meant for Detroit style pizza and we can pump out a pretty high quality Detroit style pizza using a piece of equipment that it's not meant for. Right. How full are you when you're trying to test out Detroit style pizzas? Cause I mean, Neapolitan pizza is light. You yeah. don't have to put a lot of cheese on. There's not a lot of toppings that go yeah. on it, but Detroit style pizza is so filling. Yeah, it really is. So, so when we were doing a lot of R and D, we we're eating a lot of pizza. <laughs> Um, and for me, you know, my whole thing was I wanted, I wanted to still get somewhat of a light crust. I mean, yes, it, it's heavy in the sense, like 
you put a lot of cheese on it. You, yeah. You, wanna, you know, the Ronies and things like that and all the rendering stripped down. So it can be heavy. Um, for me, I wanted a nice light airy dough. Um, and, and I came up with a blend of flours and it's almost, I compare it to like a focaccia like crust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's super light and airy. It's not like your traditional crispy, crispy bottom. Um, but it, again, I like the, the, the balance between like your crispy crown around the perimeter and then the soft dough. And, and that's probably the biggest, like the most positive feedback I receive is in regards to my dough. Um, and, and that's, that's almost instant gratification because we've worked so hard on our dough recipes, you know, for an, <laughs> at least a straight year and we're still dialing it in, tweaking yeah. it as we go along. And I don't think that'll ever end. Yeah. Um, cause obviously continuous improvement is, is super important, you know, to any sort of business. And for me, it's, it's constantly tweaking and adjusting and figuring out, you know, what recipes to use depending on the time of year. But no, we definitely are, are super excited about our Detroit style pizza. Yeah. Your dough recipe is never done, right? I've talked to so many people on the podcast and it's always a, a work in progress. You're always trying to make it a little bit better every single day. So there's never going to be a point where you're like, I've perfected it and I'm never touching it again. Yeah. The, and, and that's one of the things that I've, I've come to realize, you know, like so many people tell me, you know, it's perfect. You don't need to change it, but there's so many different things that affect it, you know, throughout the different times of year. So you yeah. have to tweak it for the different, you know, temperatures that you're, you're affected by or, the ambient temperature or, you know, the, the, how hard the water is, all that stuff. Um, and, and it really is a science and it's, it's really like a game of cat and mouse in a way. Yeah. Cause um, especially in the, like the Northeast area, like, you know, it's 90 degrees one month and then not eight months later, it's 20 below. Oh my God. Rochester, New York, our weather is absurd. So like <laughs> it's been 40 and raining and raining. And then this weekend we have 80 degree weather on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's like, <laughs> How do you go from one way to the other way? And it, it's it's just like that throughout the entire year. It's pretty bizarre. What sauce do you use? I'm a, by the uh, by by the way, if you're listening to the podcast, go follow them on Instagram, uh, Peels on Wheels Pizza on Instagram. Your pizzas look amazing, by the way. Thanks. There was, there was one video I was watching. I was actually watching that video of you trying not trying. You were making the Detroit style pizzas in the oven, and it was like a I don't know if it was like a a, a sped up video, but it's like literally you just sitting there. Oh, that's, spin that's the pizza. I mean, that's not sped up or anything. That's oh, really? from oven to oven. That's a lot of work, my man. Yeah, it really is. And and that Detroit style, like I said, it's it's meant to be baked at about 500 degrees, 550. But yeah. the box oven, it's it's at its lowest setting. It's like 750. So <laughs> yeah. it really is like a game, you know, going from one oven to, to the other oven when you have four going at once. So I've been making a lot of Detroit style pizzas at my house lately. I've just been into it. I don't know what got into me, but I just been into that, that style lately. So I know that it, it's different, right? Like that I have a, one of those ovens, not, not the one you mentioned, but I have a different one and yeah. I use it outdoors. Um, I couldn't imagine cooking a Detroit style pizza in there though. Oh, I, I, and again, it's, it's scary too, because you got all that grease that's, that's bubbling and sp- battering and then you got that big rolling flame on the top so i've had a couple of times where <laughs> uh, like grease caught on fire and it was, it was pretty scary but i'm not saying uh, it, it's dangerous territory whatsoever but it's definitely not ideal for detroit's but we make it happen and that's why we do it once a month and yeah. keep it on the tea. it's got to be one of those things where it's like stressful but satisfying when it's over because i'm sure it's like before it happens you're probably super stressed out you have like a oh. hundred people coming for detroit's like it's like I don't know. There's a lot of things in life where you're like the anticipation, you're like, once it's over, you're like, or like you're going through it and you're like, I'm never doing that again. And then it's <laughs> over and you're like, that wasn't so bad. Maybe we could do it again. A hundred percent. So when we first started doing them, I think we were only doing like 50 in a pop-up and um, that back then it was just like, Oh, that's way too much. And then we try to push the boundaries and like, <laughs> yeah. oh, up the 60 this week. And then yeah. got more and more as we dialed in the processes, the recipe and all that. So and then figuring out how to properly space out all those pre-orders and also be able to accommodate walk-ups. But at yeah. this point, now it's just straight pre-orders. So we can time it out pretty much perfectly and pretty strategically um, for like, you know, whether it's a three hour, five hour, seven hour window. Is that because of COVID or that's just a better system for you? It's just a better system, especially for the Detroit style. So we, 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 we try to space them out. So obviously we can only do a certain amount per oven per hour right um and and really that's what it boils down to and also it allows us to to keep you know quality you know as as a priority 
for these pop-ups. You know, I, I could easily probably sell 150 or 200 in, in a three hour window, but I think you run the risk of, of, of what is it? Uh, not having a high quality product. Yeah. You don't so, want to do that. Um, for me, it's, it's, it was more of quality over quantity. Yeah. Um, and we've always stuck to that motto and, and I think it's worked out in our favor, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fun style pizza and, and we're having fun with it, you know, at our pop-ups and, and we're super happy to, to be able to offer that unique style pizza to Rochester, New York, because it was kind of, like I said, I think we all got complacent in our city yeah. type of pizza that we had. And now there's a little bit of a renaissance and I'm, I'm super happy to be a part of it. And I just want to make an impact in my community when it comes to pizza. Yeah. I mean, even in my city, I'm from Boston and, you know, I'm probably going to get a lot of shit for saying this, but Boston's been notoriously known for bad places. Like there was one, there was a list and I don't even care. Santarpio's, which is a place here. It's not bad pizza. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this Santarpio's is bad. It's okay pizza. Uh, but it was like number seven in the best places in, in the country. Out of a 101 list, there was a, a list of 101 best pizza places in the country, and Santarpio's was number seven. And that made it might have been true 20, 25 years ago, but it's not even the seventh best pizza in Boston. And Boston's kind of going through that same renaissance that you're referring to. Is there's a lot of great pizzerias starting to pop up in the Boston area, whereas 15, 20, 25 years ago, it was really crap pizza. Like we had really bad pizza here. So for me, um, we lived in in the South Bronx. I mean, I was 10 minutes away from Yankee Stadium. I mean, we ate pizza two, sometimes three times a week, whether it was yeah. getting a slice or, you know, my, my parents were ordering it for dinner. I mean, we, we were spoiled, obviously, being in New York City. And I'd probably say that's probably the, the next biggest Mecca other than Italy. Right. And um, so to be there and have that, and then we move to Western New York. I mean, I'd never seen a cow in real life. Like, <laughs> in real life let alone, you know, as much grass and trees and cornfields. And um, so to go from there was complete culture shock. And that was the first thing that we, we missed was like good pizza. Yeah. Good pizza. Cause we moved to the countryside. And honestly, I want to say that my graduating class in high school, there was like 64 kids. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's super, super small in comparison to where I had like 60 kids in my third grade class, you know, or fourth grade class. So um, not like in a classroom, <laughs> Right, right, right. And not graduating, graduating. There was thousands of kids, but um, but yeah, to go from that to this, and then obviously pizza's been something that's very important to to me because it's kind of part of the roots of where I grew up. And uh, from there, you know, this year it just kind of became more of an obsession. And and you know, this rock box oven actually you know opened my eyes to the pizza industry entirely. That it's it's far larger than what I originally thought. Yeah, it is for sure. And it's also a very welcoming community. And I've met some awesome people who have helped me navigate myself through this industry and, and providing their insight and guidance. And, and there's so many people, you know, and, and one of my great friends, um, she's actually become one of my great friends is Lupa Cota from, from California and Inez. She's, yeah, yeah. she's been a huge, huge help for me because she's been building a brand out there for a while. And we both utilize the rock box oven. So we bounce ideas off each other and we talk, you know, a few times a week and at least once or every other week we have a phone call and she's just great help. She yeah. Really she's great. We, we just recently had her on the podcast a few weeks ago. Oh, really? Yeah. I think, uh, maybe, I don't know, five or six weeks ago, she joined me on the podcast and um, yeah, she's was, awesome. Yeah, she's great. She does a great job too with her recipes and her branding and like what she's trying to do in the LA market, which is a tough market too. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, no, uh, the Rochester area, like I said, there's a renaissance going on, and and I think with our concept and and our quality pizza, we're 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 gonna do great things in our city. Do you have any desire to open a brick and mortar, or are you just strictly mobile? That's what you want to do. No, I, I mean, there's, there's definitely the hopes and dreams of opening a brick and mortar. I don't want to grow too fast. I want to continue to do this mobile setup. I think it's a fun concept and I want to really, really build that brand, especially with this little truck. I mean, I keep talking about this little truck. We, we imported from Naples, Italy. And, and if for anyone who's been there, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about, but it's a Piaggio Ape. And this little three wheel truck is used everywhere throughout Europe, really. And obviously it's, it was manufactured and built in Italy. And um, it was built because of their small and narrow streets. So this little thing is their mail truck, it's their garbage truck, yeah. their food trucks, you see them everywhere. 
And uh, my wife and I, we actually were lucky enough to honeymoon in Italy. We fell in love with these things when we saw them there. If you would have asked us while we were there, if we would ever import one to the U.S., we would have said <laughs> probably in mind. So uh, we eventually somehow came up with the concept, you know, because of the Gosney community and me coming across a gentleman by the name of Peddling Pizzas, um, who's yeah. actually sponsored by Gosney. Uh, I saw that concept and I went from wanting a workhorse box truck to figuring out how to import one of these to the U.S. He has a similar so, truck, right? Yeah, he's got the exact same thing. Obviously, being that he's in Europe, he has a newer one. He can get the bigger models. I got the biggest one I can get here. Yeah. It's so funny. I say it's the biggest one. People see it. They're like, they come smaller. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So, so It's on have, your Instagram, isn't it? Like a picture of it? Yeah, it's on my Instagram. I mean, you'll see little video clips of me driving it through, through you know, from pop-up to pop-up. But we... We haul it on a trailer for the most part. Um, we fire it up just to, you know, pull it out of the parking lot, things like that. But it's a 1980, you know, it's really hard to, to source parts for. So I just don't want to deal with, you know, ruining the motor or anything like that. I just want to keep it just because it's, it's obviously the fragility of it is just as important. And um, it's a super- it's like your mascot. Yeah, it really is. I mean, when people see that truck, they're like, what is that? Where yeah. is it from? How did you get it? And then there's the people who have been to Italy. They're like, I can't believe you got this here. And then obviously the people who are from Italy or, or you know, the older generation, they're like, I haven't seen this in, you know, 20 years since I've been back home and things like that. So it's cool to make those connections. Yeah, I love it. It's actually pretty cool. Again, go to your Instagram. You can see that truck there. And, yeah. Uh, say hello to Lewis on Instagram. Lewis, if it was great talking to you. If people want to come say hello to you, where should they go? I know we mentioned your Instagram, which is Peels on Wheels Pizza. Uh, any other place they should go to say hello or hang out with you? No, I mean, just social media platforms or via my website. I mean, they can contact me there at any time. And What's uh, your website? It's uh, www.peelsonwheelspizza.com. I'm a crappy host. I probably should have known that. I knew your Instagram, <laughs> but I didn't check out your, your website. I got to double check that now. I think it's Peels on Wheels. You link it from your Instagram though, right? So if they yeah, go to Peels on, on Wheels. There. Yeah, yeah, you can click on it. It says visit our website, all that. So Yeah, go follow him on Instagram. Your pies look amazing on Instagram, by the way. Thank you, um, thank you. I, and you can see his Ape truck there too. That's just pretty neat. Uh, yeah, Lewis, it really, it really is. It was amazing talking to you. I appreciate you. I know everybody's busy, so I appreciate you taking the time out and joining me here on the oh, podcast, man. It was a great wow. talk. No, I appreciate the opportunity and consideration. And I look forward to having a, f a few more conversations with you over time. Yeah, man, let's go. Let's, let's do a follow-up in a year. It's like when this whole Corona thing is over and your, your business is thriving, come, we'll have you come back on and give us an update of what you're up to. Hopefully at that point, I'll get a brick and mortar. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> are you gonna, if you get a brick and mortar, are you going to do it in Rochester? Or are you going to do it in your home, like your home city of New York City? Uh, no, right now I'm, I'm just focusing here on Rochester. I think I, I've, I've got my family and all my friends and so many ties here now. And, yeah. and you know, obviously in New York City, there's a ton of competition out there. That is true. Um, and I, I got I got some big shoes to fill if I'm going to go out there and attempt to, to open a brick and mortar out there. Uh, I love going out there and just doing my research. That's it. Doing my yeah. homework. All right, we'll, we'll have you back on when you do that. All righty. All right. Thanks, man.